Hello students, good evening. How are you and how you are keeping fit and fine? Right, so today we are going to uh, move forward and solve a uh, bit of a numerical based upon the last article. The last article which we did was for the matter waves, a uh, new kind of the waves which were not the sound waves, which were not the EM waves, which were not the light waves. They were basically what? The matter waves. The matter which is moving, the matter which is moving, not stationary. The matter which is moving introduces or uh, associates a wave-like nature and how to explain that wave-like nature by generating the concept of the matter waves. The idea fueled by de Broglie and of course it was later on uh, given a stamp and uh, uh, talked about by the Max Born also. Like we had the likes of the discussions with uh, Albert Einstein and Max Planck and the other physicists also, like we incorporated the third postulate of the Neil Bohr theory also and beautifully explained the radiationless orbit in some mannerism by the de Broglie hypothesis and we uh, kind of made us understand that uh, why the matter waves are so important to explain the reason because it gives us an idea of the wave particle duality and to understand that particular idea was that either a particular matter behaves as a particle in some physical condition and in some other physical condition where uh, the wave character cannot be analyzed it will be analyzed as a particle character and where the particle character cannot be analyzed it will be behaved as a wave character both the characters cannot be exhibited simultaneously right so uh, keeping in this view that we do talk about the wave particle duality but we have to keep this thing in mind that both these behavior cannot be analyzed simultaneously just like we discussed that if you are dealing with the microscopic particles like uh, subatomic particles like electrons and uh, protons in this case the mass is so less that the wavelength becomes appreciable and hence the diffraction effects will be appreciable and therefore the wave nature can be studied easily but if you are talking about a massive objects the living time objects like the ball or earth or let's say our mass in that case the mass is so huge that the wavelength does not become appreciable and therefore the designing of the apertures of that particular size will be not possible practically and hence the diffraction effects will not be prominent and therefore the wave nature will not be read so prominently and hence in those situations uh, the matter must behave as a particle then we talked about the max bond uh, theory theory uh, based upon that how to basically locate a particular particle that was by studying the intensity behavior or the square of the amplitude of the de Broglie wave. Through that particular idea we can have the probability of the location of the particle in that particular region. We also we also talked about the idea regarding the quantization of the orbit in which we said only integral number of the waves can be adjusted in a quantized orbit. Because of which we were able to explain that uh, there exists a electron matter stationary wave in the orbits of the Neil Bohr and kind of develop a relationship between the new born modern theory and as well as with the uh, pre existing theories like uh, electromagnetic wave theory. While the other four, four theory was kind of generating a conflict and was kind of getting rejected, but then this hypothesis basically made it a uh, real behavior that okay there can be a possibility to answer that why electron are not associated with the uh, spiral orbits and why the orbit should be basically radiationless of course it is considered as a limitation of the Neil Bohr theory because uh, during his calculations Neil Bohr did not mention that how the orbits must be radiationless but still there is an argument which is left around and because of the existence of the electron matter stationary wave, this idea can be fueled up. Right? So, so such beautiful things were discussed in the last uh, leg of the lecture. And now today, we are going to look at some of the numerical aspect of this particular idea which we have developed. And then we are going to move ahead. So, let's begin and rock start this day. So, first of all, we are uh, going to, uh, in a direction to pay tribute to the relativistic idea, of course. And see, this begins with the Einstein theory of relativity and 1903 and 1905, the energy ponderation concepts and all, which means that we cannot now neglect the idea of the relativity. Beforehand, 
when we were dealing with the classical physics, we always had this idea, okay, now what is going to happen? Uh, now we have the speeds which are much lesser than the speed of light and therefore we cannot apply the theory of the relativity right now. And we should do uh, our theories in uh, conjecture with the Newton frame somni. But now, since the whole of the idea has become for the photons, the matter waves and so on, so therefore this idea cannot be neglected and therefore we must pursue the further course of action, the further course of study based upon this idea. So, whenever we think about as a student, about the theory of the relativity, two of the terms basically enchants us. The first term is supposed to be energy mass equivalence, as E is supposed to be equal to mc square. Let me write it for you. As E is equal to mc square, that's also known as the energy mass equivalence. And it's of great importance because there are certain, uh, certain entities in which we cannot define the mass using the standards of a physical balance or by bringing that particular mass in a static state, right? So we have that limitation with us and therefore we can alternatively calculate their mass that is a moving mass by the energy equivalence. That means E upon C square is going to generate the mass of that particular moving particle or a moving entity like a photon which is not even a uh, particle, which is not even a particle. It is basically what a entity, it is not a material particle, but still we are able to analyze this mass kind of a virtual mass through the energy concept. All right now. So uh, this relation, this relation includes M. What is M in this? M is supposed to be the mass of the particle. Of course, you can also use it for the photon. I, I do understand that particular thing. You can use it for the photon also. So we uh, read that in the last lecture also that the theory which we are pronouncing is uh, applicable for the material particles also and for the non-material particles also. So do remain uh, uh, in lieu with that particular idea. Okay. So M is a mass of the particle, which a particle that is a moving particle. Right. You can also apply this uh, uh, to be in a, a condition of rest also. Right. In a condition of rest also. In that case, its rest mass energy will be zero. If that moving particle comes in a state of rest, then in that case, its rest mass energy will be zero. Now you will be wondering, and what is supposed to be the rest mass energy? So what is the rest mass energy? That is, if that particle whom we are talking about is in a state of rest or deliberately brought in a state of rest, maybe, right? So, then the energy of it will be equal to m naught into c square. What is m naught? That is supposed to be the uh, rest mass of the particle. So, this e naught will be defined as a rest mass energy right so uh, now it depends upon that m is more than m naught if it is then this energy will come out to be more than this that means when the particle will be moving so definitely it makes a sense that it will be having the more energy right so what will be the relation between the two that is e and e naught let's check upon that particular relation that's our article heading the relativistic energy of the particles so we had a second famous relation with us which all of us are acquainted with that is mass relation m equal to m naught upon uh, that dilation factor right so we have m as m naught upon under root 1 minus v square upon c square so using this we are going to get our result we need to cross multiply this right and square it and square it so on squaring it uh, on both the sides i am getting this as m naught square and into 1 minus v square upon c square as equal to that's m square and this is m naught right right we just need to adjust this particular term so just to incorporate a relation between them so first of all the idea is very very clear that what we are doing we're going to relate, uh, relate these two terms right and let's look at that how will we be able to apply the total energy of a particle right total energy of a particle. So over here this becomes m square minus m square v square upon c square as equal to m naught square. What I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by c power 4 and you will be wondering then why c power 4 reason the terms are mc square. So this is already m. So if I multiply by c square it will be m c square but we want what? 
mc square whole square right so we multiply this whole equation by c power 4 on both the sides right on both the sides so that will be m square c power 4 minus m square v square c power 4 upon c square will be c square is equal to m naught square and into c power 4 that does not make any difference because I have multiplied by c power 4 on both the sides of the equation so that is not harmful for the status of this equation now this basically solves my whole expression where mc square is supposed to be e and so this expression becomes as e square is equal to taking this term on the right side that becomes mv uh, whole square and into c square just taking the term on the right side and plus that is m naught c square whole square so m naught c square whole square that becomes e naught square so that's e naught square right so i'm just able to complete my relation over there what is m into v that's supposed to be the momentum of the particle that's the momentum of the particle so that's equal to p square that's p square c square and plus e naught square that's e square and therefore i'm able to get a value for the e from here so the value for the e from here that becomes root of that is p square c square and plus of e naught square that becomes a relation so that's the relation to keep us keep it with us and you can find the relation also like this that is root of p square c square and plus that is m naught square c power 4 that's also the relation we will be interested in right so uh, and in the event that that particular particle is supposed to be in a state of rest it is quite possible that that particle is supposed to be in a state of rest in that case m naught is going to become equal to zero right so this energy will not be existing over there and the energy will be entirely because of the momentum of that particular uh, particle Right? Well, so if the M0 is not supposed to be there, the particle is not in the state of rest, like non-material particles like photons, which are not in the state of rest, so the M0 will be equal to what? Zero. In that case, uh, the energy will be entirely because of its momentum. Correct? Right? So when you're talking this expression for the case of a materialistic particle like electron, you'll have to consider both the form of energy, energy by the momentum of it, current momentum of it, because that particle will be moving and energy because of its rest mass like electron has a rest mass of 9.1 into 10 power minus 31 kilograms so because of it it will be having this portion of energy and since it is also moving right now and because the matter wave condition is because of its motion correct and therefore it will be having the extra energy as we see and uh, this is the coolest way to make us understand that how this expression is derived from here because of the energy mass equivalence and your relativistic mass energy And uh, explained it very beautifully that if it is supposed to be a non-material particle like a photon, so be careful. In that case, the rest mass energy does not exist. So this portion will be zero. But since, since it will be moving, so it has a momentum. And therefore, the second part of the energy do exist. So let's move on and uh, generate the conceptuals on this idea which I have just given you right now. And this says to me as a question, a photon and an electron have the same de Broglie wavelength. A photon and electron. So there are two particles. One is a photon. And second is electron. Of course, both are a different, different. Reason because one is a material particle, second is a non-material particle, like we mentioned. A photon is a non-material particle. It does not carry any mass. While the electron is supposed to be a material particle. But they can both have they both can have particle nature so therefore i'm telling them as a particle but one is supposed to be non-material means it does not carry any rest mass so there is no rest mass in this this electron definitely has a rest mass and you know the mass of the uh, electron also as a rest mass right so they have the same de Broglie wavelength that's a connecting between them otherwise they are different particles so they have some connection between them and the next article which is coming up is supposed to be the photoelectric effect where we will be talking about them together and also uh, generate a generic name like a photoelectric or a photoelectron, right? So we will be talking about that phenomena also in the upcoming lecture. So they have the same de Broglie wavelength. Okay, so we have a lambda same for them. Okay, in this question, of course, they always is not the same. It is for this question, which is a greater kinetic energy. That means it, the question proves to us our point that uh, that concept of the matter wave is applicable for both of them. 
even for a materialistic particle and for a non-materialistic particle also it is applicable right so which is a greater kinetic energy it is asking us so let's solve this so let's solve this so kinetic energy the greater kinetic energy be careful with the expression what it is asking kinetic energy so what is the kinetic energy of an electron so kinetic energy of the electron is supposed to be equal to half into m into v square that's it m is the mass of the electron m is the mass of the electron and v is supposed to be the speed of that particular electron simple now the wavelength of the electron how can you write a wavelength of the electron i can write the wavelength of the electron as equal to h upon mv this is same mass and the same speed same mass and the same speed that's the mass of electron that's the mass of electron right that's the speed of the electron as a particle this is speed of the electron as a particle speed of electron as a particle absolutely that correct and then you are talking about that the wavelength of the photon is same that means this wavelength is the same that is h upon mv that's the same now when we are talking about the energy of the photon now how do we write the energy of the photon that is supposed to be hc upon lambda because you cannot associate the mass with the photon directly and therefore i am writing the energy as how much hc upon lambda correct the all the energy is supposed to be in the kinetic state only for the photon reason because it is not having any rest mass energy so it is always moving so all the energy is what that is mass energy no the the kinetic energy so and the question is demanding about the kinetic energy also so hc by lambda so substitute lambda because the question says they have the same de Broglie wavelength so we are equating lambda for the photon and lambda for the electron correct right? so that becomes h jumps up mevt -E. so this h cancels so that's the kinetic energy for the case of the photon and that's equal to m uh, into c and into v so m into v and into c so that pretty much solves the question because from here uh, this is m into v and into v e by 2 right this is the kinetic energy of the electron and if you compare these two if you compare these two you can easily find that this term c this term c over here is more than v by 2 because we know that the speed of the particle will be always less than the speed of light so v e is less than c because we know that fact of course we also know that fact the speed of the matter wave can be more than uh, the speed of light in fact it is the speed of the particle will be less than the speed of light and therefore uh, this is coming out to be less than mev into c because v e by 2 will be less than c and therefore the kinetic energy of the electron is less than kinetic energy of the photon so i have solved this question with the ultimate clarity with you ultimate clarity and explaining that what we learned in the last uh, uh, lecture was so important so important to reach to this particular solution and still the question might try to confuse you might try to how come let's look at it but a question is like this and now it looks like it's a repeated question and you might also see while you're solving it you might see oh it's a repeated question i know the answer for it but then what happens the question tricks you what's the question it says there is a photon and an electron it looks like the same question have the same de Broglie wavelength but what it is asking changes the game and what it is which has a greater total energy and now it is talking about a greater total energy so my dear the starting the beginning of today's lecture is going to solve the question of the day now it says the total energy so the total energy which we have derived is equal to root of p square c square and plus m naught square c power 4 that's the expression for the total energy correct and now this solves a question reason because when we're talking for the photon for the case of the photon the m naught is equal to zero that is for the photon the rest mass of the photon is zero and therefore therefore the energy will be only root of p square c square plus zero so that's equal to p into c that's the energy for the case of the photon and while you are talking about the electron for the electron when you're talking about this particular energy for the electron that becomes a root of p square c square plus this term because for the electron 
the rest mass isn't zero. We know the rest mass of electron 9.1 into 10 power minus 31. In fact, we also know mc square, m not c square for electron. That's 0.51 mEV. Right? You can calculate that also. That is m not c square. Uh, for the electron, that's 0.51 mEV. So, so that's not zero. If it is not enough, it is actually enough 0.51 mEV. And so it is pretty clear who wins the show. And what does this is an idea? Same de Bruyne wavelength, same de Bruyne wavelength. Wavelength is h upon p. So if lambda is same, p is same. By the de Broglie. Lambda is h upon v. Since we shall say same wavelength. So the momentum is same. So the p in this both the expression is same. That's very clarified. That this particular term is higher than this. Because of this extra term. So therefore the total energy of the electron is more than the total energy of the photon. And the answer gets reversed. In the last slide, in the last question, we mentioned the question as which has a higher kinetic energy. So the answer came out to be that a photon had a higher kinetic energy. And right now when we are comparing with the total energy, we are able to see that in that case, we have the electron having the more total energy, the reason because of the rest mass energy. And this all relation is because both of them have the same wavelength in that condition, right? So let's move forward. Look at another such question where you might get also Confused that once again the same kind of a question is there. And once again, I will try to show you the difference. This is not a photon, it's a proton this time. And which means that now we are comparing with the two actual particles. That means the two material particles. Both of them are carrying the rest mass. So let me check in the rest mass for the electron. That's equal to 9.1 into 10 power minus 31 kilogram. And let me check the rest mass for the case of the proton. So oh, that's 1.673 into 10 power minus 27 kilogram. Uh, that's uh, around 1836 times the rest mass of electron. It's, uh, we do know that uh, who is a, a heavier particle, right? Who is supposed to be the heavier particle? So who is a heavier particle? Uh, that's a proton. Proton seems to be a heavier particle. And now these two have the same de Bruyne wavelength. That means the Lambda is same and lambda is h upon p. So if the lambda is same, the p is same. So the momentum is same for both of them. I think that will pretty much solve our question that the overall energy question is asking the total energy once again. So the total energy is supposed to be equal to root of p square c square and plus m naught square c power 4. So if it is for the proton, this is the energy of the proton. And if you are talking about an electron, so since this condition is there, that a wavelength for the proton is wavelength for the electron. So therefore, from this condition, we have the momentum of the proton and momentum of the electron to be same as equal to P because of the uh, relation by the de Broglie. And so this relation becomes P square C square plus uh, M naught square C power 4 by M naught is for the electron. And since the first part of this, the first part of this is same. So the only relation becomes between them. And as pretty much we have seen over there that uh, M0 for the proton is more than the M0 for the electron. And it's pretty higher. And so the overall energy of the proton becomes more than for the electron. Right up. So let's move ahead and look into the next question. The next question is uh, coming from the article of the electron microscope for which we have already devised in the relation and where we had a wavelength of the electron matter wave. Repeating again, the wavelength of the electron matter wave was expressed as h upon under root of twice of m into q delta v. And if it is for the case of the electron, then uh, this will be h value we know that 6.5. Uh, 62 into 10 power minus 34 uh, SI units and then we had mass of the electron as 9.1 into 10 power minus 31 and the charge on the electron as a, in the magnitude of course 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 coulomb placing all these values this expression works upon as equal to root of 150 upon V and a wavelength will come out in 
angstrom after doing all the good calculation and if we know this relation if we have developed a fourth by our calculation by knowing the standard out uh, terms over there so this question becomes easier is telling the potential difference of 50 volt is applied to accelerate an electron so we need to find a de Broglie wavelength of it associated with it that means it is talking about a matter width right that's an electron matter width the wavelength of that electron matter width so that's given by this so the wavelength in the angstrom or will be simply equal to root of 150 upon 50 and that becomes root 3 so hence the wavelength becomes 1.73 angstrom is supposed to be my final answer and i'm pretty cool about this because the expression really works for me right so i need to place this relation in my flashcards such that i'm able to solve the question in the stipulated time the next one this is a reverse question exactly the same you can read it and you can solve it now you can pause it and solve it right so please pause the video and solve it all right i think you are back and you are back and you would have solved this particular question and it would have seemed to be very very easy just the reverse of what we did right now that a wavelength in angstrom is supposed to be equal to root of 150 upon v that's it i mean to solve this the wavelength in this uh, question is given as 0.4 so that's 0.4 as a root of 150 upon v. So we square it up, so we'll get 0.16 as equal to 150 upon v. Uh, so v should become from here as equal to 150 upon 0.16. So that's 16 into 100. So that's 4 and 25. So uh, that's uh, 150 into 25 upon 4 for the calculation. Uh, that should be 75 so that's 75 into 25 upon 2 so that's 625 and into 3 upon 2 like that right so uh, that becomes 3 1 2.5 into 3 so that becomes uh, 3557 uh, 937.5 so that's our voltage which is applied over there that's coming at 937.5 the answer may be rounded up to 940 so that's 940 volt of the accelerating potential which is required so pretty easy calculation uh, no uh, uh, difficult substitution of the values because we have eased it out by uh, clubbing in the values for the h m and e over there right moving ahead to the next one it says calculate the ratio of the accelerating potential required to accelerate a proton and alpha particle uh, having the same de Broglie wavelength so the condition is uh, the wavelength is same so the wavelength of the proton particle and the alpha particle is same so it's once again coming uh, uh, from the conjecture of the uh, de Broglie hypothesis the modern theory with the classical electrodynamics theory in which we have developed the relation that wavelength is equal to h upon under root twice of m into q delta v so that's going to pretty much solve our question here that the wavelength of the proton uh, is equal to the wavelength of the alpha particle so that should be h upon uh, root of 2 into mass of the proton and charge for the proton and into the potential applied across the proton is equal to h upon under root of twice of mass of the alpha particle charge of the alpha particle and the potential difference applied across the alpha particle so this h gets cancelled, 2 gets cancelled, we can square on both the sides and we receive mp, qp, delta vp uh, taking up, taking up, this one and the same thing that becomes m alpha, q alpha and delta v alpha squaring both the sides, right, we can square this side, square this side, square goes off and uh, crossing it, okay so that's, that's pretty much solves the question that the mass of the proton if it is m so mass of alpha particle is how much? 4m because that's helium 2,4 particle, right? And uh, the charge uh, for the proton, if it is E, so the charge on the alpha particle is twice of E, H, E, 2,4. So the, the dominant number goes to 2 and the mass number goes to 4, right? So twice and twice of the charge and 4 times of the mass. That's it. That basically solves your question. So that's M and E gets cancelled out. And so the ratio completes the question. That's a potential difference 
for the prodon and the alpha particle which should be applied in order to accelerate them to achieve the same wavelength that's equal to uh, a dis to 1 that's what answer 4 into 2 is 8 so a dis to 1 completed let's move ahead he said what will be the change in the wavelength if the accelerating potential so uh, we are actually making us comfortable with the idea of the accelerating potential from every tune of the questions which we can get in, right so it's once again the same it's like a conceptual I'm just mentioned in numerical but it is actually a conceptual what will be the change in the wavelength if it is increased to four times the earlier value the accelerating potential so it's the same solution that wavelength is h upon under root twice of m q delta v so that clearly states that lambda is proportional to 1 upon root of delta v. Clearly. Because in this case we aren't changing the particle. So the particle changes and m will change, q will change, right? But since the particle is not changing and there are no two comparative particles, so the question is directly to the amount of the accelerating potential which you are going to apply and that solves the question. It's a reverse behavior. So it becomes 4 times it becomes four times, right? So what about the, so uh, accelerating potential becomes four times, so the wavelength should become as half over this, right? So using this, that's a lambda g upon lambda uh, is supposed to be as reverse of it. So that's uh, delta v nu and will be delta v because of the inverse, right? So the new accelerating potential is four times. So that cancels. So once I can mention the new wavelength is equal to lambda upon 2. So the wavelength becomes half. You can of course mark in the objective directly over there. I've just shown you even if you get a one mark question as a subjective then also you can uh, just place your answer comfortably over here like this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's move ahead for the next question. Uh, it's, it's a very good question. It's a very good question and uh, the question basically focuses upon an idea. The fact basically that does electrons actually exist in the nucleus or this question arises from the basic fact that Rutherford theory was failed in the respect that uh, the theory could be in conflict with the EM wave that electron is going to spiral and fall into nucleus but aisa hota nahi hai. the electron does not fall inside the nucleus and because of which we need to prove this particular question that it is correct because that will be supporting the fact that electron does not fall inside the nucleus and we people and the electron as an entity remains stable in the Niel Bohr orbit. So let's check this out. The extent of the localization of the particle is determined roughly by the de Broglie wave. If an electron is localized within the nucleus, the size is given as 10 power minus 14. It's 10 power minus 14 of an atom. What is the energy? And so what is the energy? So we can uh, talk about the energy of it as Hc by lambda. That will be the energy of it. It is supposed to be the energy of the electron as a matter wave, right? Because of, you see the particle idea anyway gets flopped. Where as an accelerated charged particle, electron must lose the energy and fall into the nucleus, right? So we cannot approach the question from that materialistic idea that considering electron as a particle. So we have left with one choice. And that is to treat it as a matter which is moving and hence associate a matter wave according to it and calculate the energy of that because of its wavelength of that matter wave. That's exactly what we are doing. And from here, it can calculate this amount of energy. And the question will be easily done. So, so what have we done is, that's more important. Calculation is too easy. That will be easily done. The only thing which we understand that what did we do basically. And why did we do it? Reason because when we were considering electron as a charged particle. In that case, it was an accelerated charged particle. Hence, it must lose energy and spiral out into the nucleus. But that is not evident in any experimental phenomenon. Correct. And that also challenges the stability of the atom. So that must not be true. Or rather, we must challenge it. So how do we challenge it? By taking the concept somewhere else. By not considering that electron matter as a particle and associating the motion of that electron with an electron matter wave and there must be some wavelength of that matter wave and hence it can have 
an energy. So we're trying to calculate the energy because of that wavelength. So if I substitute it over here, that's H into C. If you have seen my previous videos, you would have understood that how we have actually rejoiced by clubbing in H and C and the beautiful value by clubbing H and C. Of course, you can use the standardized values also if you have not watched my lecture before. Right? But if you have watched it, as most of you have done, so we'll find that H into C was supposed to be written as 2 into 10 power minus 25. So it was very beautiful to write the relation in this particular mannerism to ease out the calculation. And divided by the wavelength, which over here uh, is uh, 10 power minus 40. That's enough value. You can go on uh, calculating the exact value by using H as 6.62 into 10 power minus 34. We do know uh, those values. So that's SI and C value we know. So we just uh, actually made it a little simple for us by using this. And so this particular relation works upon as equal to as a 2 into 10 power minus uh, 11, right? Uh, 10 power minus 11. Approximate relation, approximate. Because we, we aren't interested in the exact relation because we have an argument over here. So we are talking about the order the ranges, right? Okay. So 2 into 10 power minus 11 in uh, Joule. In Joule. So that is 2 into 10 power minus 11 divided by 1.6 into 10 power minus 13. And that becomes MeV. Not EV, MeV. We do understand that. That we have uh, 1 EV as 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 Joule. And this is basically for uh, atomic structure we use this. Right? Uh, so this is a unit which is comfortable for atomic energy levels. And then uh, we have of course the relation that is 1 MeV. And that is a mega 10 power 6 times this. And this expression is basically for the nuclear energy levels. So that, that's pretty simple. Nucleus is supposed to be the powerhouse of energy. And uh, the electrons which are orbiting around the nucleus have a much lesser energy because they are actually uh, bounded by the Coulombian forces, uh, Coulomb's electrostatic forces, electromagnetic forces. They are bounded by that kind of forces which is not a very very strong force. And therefore the energy associated with the case of the electrons is not very high. But when you are talking about the neutrons and protons which are residing inside the nucleus, they are bounded by the strong nuclear forces and because of which the energy associated with them is supposed to be very high. That means if you are going to break that particular nucleus, a tremendous amount of energy is going to be released which exactly happens in the case of the nuclear fission, right? So the energy status basically explains to us that if you are dealing with the Niel Bohr orbits or the electron signal electron models, so the amount of the energy, you might be knowing that, ground state energy, minus 13.6, how much? EV. Uh, then N equal to 2, that's minus 3.4 EV, so it never crosses uh, EV. In fact, uh, the modulus of minus 13.6 EV is the maximum, right? And after that, it decreases itself in the modulus, okay? Because the negative sign is for the stability. So that means that the energy is in the state of EV. Why? In the case of the nucleus, it is MeV. It is MeV. Correct? Right? So that demarcation must be there in your mind. Right? This, 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 what is going to solve this question? This expression over there, this becomes equal to 20 upon 16 and into uh, how much? That is 10 power 2. So that's 4, 5, 20 and 4. 5 upon 4, that is 1.25. So 1.25 into 100. So this energy is approximated as 125 MeV. With the, with all the detailed calculations, so we'll get this value exactly 124.1 MeV, right? With all the detailed calculations, I've just taken a rough and no uh, problem in the calculations over here. So that's approximately 125 MeV, and that's also a question. With this amount of energy, electron cannot be found inside a nucleus. The reason because, uh, as for the Niel Bohr theories. The electron has an energy in the state of EV. And when Coulomb forces basically bind the electron, as given by the Rutherford model, in that case, uh, the energy level should be only of EV. Right? So, since the energy is in high MeV, thus the Coulomb interactions cannot generate this energy. 
right the coulomb interaction can generate the energy of the article of the ev which is basically the uh, calculation effort of the neil bohr which uh, we will be doing sooner and that that's calculations given by the neil bohr basically makes us understand that the energy level of course energy expression is there but the values are very very important to demarcate what's the difference between atomic physics and the nuclear physics and so from there we can say therefore electron must not be localized in nucleus right so we have given this answer by an argument so the argument is supposed to be that the uh, the coulomb force which is supposed to be responsible for the stability of the electron over there and uh, so the energy which we are grading on an electron in the different shells should be based upon the coulomb interaction itself right based upon the radii of that particular orbit because the uh, coulomb electrostatic formula stands k q1 q2 by r r is the radius of that orbit in that case so therefore will be the different energy levels of the different uh, electrons in the different shells but uh, any of the levels any of the stationary state who is not able to provide MeV kind of energy and therefore electron cannot be localized inside the nucleus. A beautiful way of explaining it, and of course a beautiful way of learning also. So let's move ahead. Uh, this is just a uh, numerical solvent where it basically tests your numerical skills. Uh, the question says that uh, for what kinetic energy of a neutron will the associated d prime wavelength will be there? So now this question is special because it talks about a neutron which is not a charged particle. So if we have seen my previous lecture, you would have seen we have been asking ourselves the questions that is this theory applicable only for charged particle or for non-charged particle also. So we uh, actually came to the conclusion that it is applicable for both of them. So it is applicable for electron or photon also, now non-material particle, proton also and non-neutron also. So that's what the beauty of this particular article is. It's applicable in so vivid horizons, a theory, an idea clicks and is acceptable by a lot of many people when it is generalized that means it can be applied to a vast scenarios just like electromagnetic wave theory was able to be applied to the last scenarios just like the Newton classical mechanic theory of the three laws of the motion is also be applicable in a wide scenarios so now what this lecture and the previous lecture basically makes us comfortable that the idea which is new to us that existence of the matter wave the wave particle duality is a new concept to us, but still now we are getting comfortable in this idea that it can be applied to many places. So it is a successful theory, a successful approach to study and analyze the physics in future. So going by it, the question says that for what kinetic energy? So definitely we are not going to use the uh, charge formula. So what's the expression we are going to use is lambda is equal to h upon p. If you do remember, we derived this p as the root of 2mk and that's what the question is demanding for what kinetic energy it is asking to us k to be calculated the wavelength is given to us so it's a proper calculative question proper calculative question you will have to spend some time on the calculation that is 1.4 into 10 power minus 10 that is 6.62 into 10 power minus 34 divided by root of 2mk mk mass of the neutron so uh, 1.67 into 10 power minus 27 if you go on to the third decimal it will be 1.675 so in keeping it 1.67 right now you can also take 1.68 and uh, into uh, k so that k needs to be calculated you can see that this is not much of a calculation or is it it seems like a bit of a calculation over there right and uh, uh, so we can square up and uh, uh, do the things so it should be uh, 2 into uh, 1.67 into 10 power minus 27 into k after squaring. So that should be 6.62 into 6.62 into 10 power squaring it minus 68 and divided by squaring this. So that's 1.96 into 10 power minus 20. That looks like it. And so we need to find out the value for the k form. Okay, so uh, let me uh, carry out a rough kind of calculation for you and see that whether we are able to be comfortable in that uh, idea. So rough calculations for this give, brings me that k should be equal to uh, 6.62 into 6.62 keeping it exactly upon uh, uh, that's uh, 2 into 1.67 rough calculations I will do and into 1.96 and into 10 power let me come in the power of 10 
that's a minus 27 minus 20 minus 47 and minus 47 goes up so that's minus 68 and plus uh, 47 that's it now 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 the time for the approximations so uh, uh, what do we do uh, approximating this by 4 and this by 2 and this by 2 approximate so the k becomes approximately 6.62 so I'm writing 6.7 by approximation and this is 10 power you can see this, I have, uh, 16 4 is 64, so 1.67 into 4, I have just approximated it and uh, uh, 2 and 1.96 so rounded off to 2, so this uh, eased out the calculation for me, right, so if you will do the exact calculation, you will get a value around this, you can try, you can try, you must try it in fact, that is 10 power minus 68 plus 47, that becomes how much, minus 21, so that's this much amount of energy and that's your answer, so I have just worked upon this as a uh, ease out calculations for you and if you're getting this in objective so you can of course mark in the closest option over there the next one please uh, the next one over there is the b part of it and it talks about the thermodynamics aspect also because we have developed so many relations so our uh, questions are based upon all the relations which were developed in the lectures so it is find a de Broglie wavelength of a neutron same in thermal equilibrium with a matter and has some temperature that's 300 kelvin so we had already developed the relation for that and the expression we have developed is lambda as equal to uh, h upon under root 3 m k t as per the relation of the uh, matter wave theory with the classical thermodynamics right and we talked about the kelvin temperature of the electrons and so on also so find out the value then uh, temperature is given as uh, 300 so that's 3 into m that's a uh, a mass of the neutron already see right now in the question uh, that's 1.67 into 10 power minus 27 k what is k the Boltzmann constant what is that equal to r upon na uh, so that's 8.314 divided by na is how much 6.02 into 10 power 23 correct and uh, this value is in fact 1.38 and into 10 power minus 23 that's a Boltzmann constant don't confuse this was a kinetic energy k and that's the separate relation that's the uh, in this k this k is the Boltzmann constant from the thermodynamics right and the temperature that's 300 so looks like once again a bit of a calculations right so we need to just ease out the calculation always focus upon that particular idea how to ease out the calculation so that you also remain comfortable in this scenario so let's once again try it that's 6.62 into 10 power minus 34 upon so this is 3 uh, and 3 from here, I am picking up an outside and the root of approximately I am doing this that is around 1.7 and uh, 1.4 approximately you know, uh, I can reduce the answer a little bit after that or increase or uh, reduce a little bit later on approximating this, approximating this to the single decimal and uh, this becomes uh, oh, 10 power minus 27 minus 23 minus 50 minus 50 and 2 minus 48 so minus 48 that becomes 10 power minus 24 10 power minus 24, correct? So sometimes the data is nearly set. So this becomes around 2.2. Uh, and if you multiply this, you will get around 2.2. Around 2.2. So that 2.2 upon root 2.2 is uh, root 2.2, in fact. And into 10 power minus 34 and 10 power minus 24, that 10 power minus 10 meters. And I think it's uh, getting solved easily. And 2.2 root, 2.25 is uh, root is 1.5. And uh, 2.25 is 1.5 and 1.4 squared will be 1.96 so it has to be somewhere in between so this works upon as around 1.45 and it's a 10 power minus 10 meter so angstrom so that stands as an answer if you will go for the actual calculation you will get 1.46 angstrom as an answer so you can buy that that uh, this calculation which i have tried out is a very much easy calculation by approximating a little term so it is just like once you don't get a mastery over this idea so you must uh, go in for the exact calculation, right? Okay. So so okay. Uh, we can move on to the next one. Oh, this is this is something like we love it. We love it when when the options are there in front of us. We love it, right? So it gives a kind of a uh, adrenaline flow. Like okay, uh, options are there. Let's be comfortable. At least we'll be able to mark something. Okay. So the question over here is that the ratio of the de Broglie wavelength of the molecules of hydrogen and helium in the two gas jars kept separately at a temperature twenty seven and one twenty seven C. What I am doing is right now is I am actually uh, 
sharing with you all the kind of numericals which have all uh, which have come through this uh, chapter in the uh, previous examinations also and also solving the key questions of your NCRD also which means I'm uh, making you proficient for solving self solving the questions rest of the questions such that you won't find any much of a difficulty and the future doubts are already solved beforehand so if I don't share this particular class with you and just rush with the topics what is going to happen is that when you will be uh, solving the questions uh, independently you will find it difficult especially the conceptual question which I discussed there were beautiful conceptual questions and it requires an in-depth teaching I think I think you can uh, have a resonance with me on that idea right so the question says the ratio of the d molar wavelength of the molecule of hydrogen and helium in the two gas jars kept separately at a temperature 27 and 127 so one is a hydrogen and second is a helium right and the ratio of the d molar wavelength uh, and it's based upon what the temperature so we know the relation so that's from the conjecture of the matter wave theory with the classical thermodynamics so that's a root of 3 m k t correct what is k in this Boltzmann constant so it's a constant 3 is a constant so lambda is proportional to 1 upon root of m into t that's what we need to focus on and solve our question so for the hydrogen and helium, we're writing hydrogen H and the helium as H E. Uh, it's an inverse relation. So first of all, for the hydrogen, that is the mass of the hydrogen, temperature of the hydrogen, absolute temperature, that means on the Kelvin scale. And for the helium, that's the mass of the helium and the temperature of the helium. That said, I think that's neatly going to solve your question and you might have got comfortable also. So you can give it a try. You can give it a try now. Pause it and check it. Pause it and check it. What's the relation you are getting? Oh, you are back and uh, I think you have got the correct answer. Which one is matching? B, C or D? Which is matching? Not A, uh, B. B is not. I, I, I actually feel that B is not an answer. Okay, this one. Oh, oh, oh. Let's see. Let's see which one. Okay, let's check this out. Mass of the helium is how much? That is uh, 4 times of M and uh, mass of the hydrogen 2. Reason is H2. And that's uh, H2, right? H12, right? How, how do we write that? So it's a hydrogen gas molecule. So it's a monoatomic, no, no, diatomic, right? And a helium, that's already we have seen that helium 2 4 particle. So 2M, it's not a proton particle. Proton particle mass is M, so helium particle mass is 4M. Hydrogen molecule, so the mass is how much? Uh, 2M, so alpha particle or the helium molecule mass will be 4M. Temperature of the helium, that becomes how much? Uh, 127 plus 273. So that works around 400 Kelvin, exactly. Uh, around, why did we say? Because it is exactly 273.15, right? So I'm just neglecting that 0.15. So that's into 400 and divided by uh, the temperature of the hydrogen, that is 27 plus 270, so that's around 300. So that's 300. I think that solves my question. Uh, how much that becomes 8 upon 3 and that beautifully uh, fits in the D part and most of you have done it correctly thanks for understanding the lecture and moving forward graph question every everywhere there should be a graphical question also to add to the spice of solving the question and that question is here and it's uh, between the wavelength and the root V so before reading the question we know the expression behind this idea the expression behind this particular idea is lambda as h upon under root 2m cube and delta v. Right? We will see the question later on. Let's see. And what does the question basically is prompting us? It's a graph of the wavelength versus 1 upon root v. 1 upon root v. So you can write this relation as lambda as uh, h upon uh, root 2m cube and into uh, 1 upon root v. So it seems to me over here that if I plot this as y and if I plot this as x so this seems to be y as h upon root 2m q and into x and this is a straight line this is a straight line graph so this term over here has to be slope and uh, it, it ba basically is y equal to uh, mx plus c I am writing this as m0x plus c the equation of the straight line 
So the intercept is zero. So the graph passes through the origin. Perfectly correct. You got there is nothing over here. So intercept is zero. And so M naught is a slope. What's the slope? The slope over here is equal to from here as h upon root of 2m cube. That's it. That's the info uh, from the graph. And the question is solved by that idea. Let's uh, read the question together. When it says there are two lines a and b, of course, there are two separate graphs, which represents a de Broglie wavelength as a function of 1 upon root b. We have decoded that particular idea. V, v, we know what is it. It's an accelerating potential of the two different particles having the same charge. So that's the condition. That's the condition, same charge. That means if I'm considering two particles, so the Q1 and Q2 uh, are the respective charges, but the question says they are same. So which of the two represents a particle of smaller mass? So uh, as you can see from here, for the A, the slope is, slope is smaller. So since the Q is same, the Q is same. So therefore it is very simple that the slope over here is proportional to 1 upon root n. Very simple. Pretty simple. So that means whichever has a smaller slope, a smaller slope will have a larger mass. So it is asking which represents a particle of the smaller mass. So we can answer very uh, easily that uh, since the slope of B is larger, hence it represents smaller mass. Right. So a uh, good question. Uh, which is basically based upon the interpretation of the graphs over there. The expression we know already that uh, the lambda is equal to h upon under root 2m q delta v. But the condition, see, look very carefully into the condition also that what the question is demanding. Right? The question demanded this condition to be applied and then uh, have an inference from here. So we infer that this slope is going to be mass is going to be Moving ahead, on to the next one. Question is, as I've talked about this question in the last lecture also and made you comfortable also that if somebody is having energy, so there must be a temperature associated with it. As a thermodynamics spoke about that uh, absolute zero kind of thing does not exist. That means everything and everything which is a matter which is moving or in a state of rest must have some kind of an absolute temperature and there must be some theory uh, which is basically going to help us in calculating it and we have that theory with us. So we have an electron with a wavelength. So that means we are not uh, considering electron as a particle any anymore. It is an electron matter wave wavelength which is given to us. So what is a Kelvin temperature? So I think that's simple for us now because we have understood the theory so well and we have practiced so well that uh, nothing can stop us from becoming a modern age physics student, right? So the wavelength is supposed to be equal to uh, h upon under root of 3 m k t. And you need to find out that temperature. That's my interest over there. What do you feel that the temperature will be uh, 37 degrees Celsius about human body temperature? What do you feel like? It's a furnace temperature? No, my friends, it is supposed to be a very cooler temperature. Electron is a very cool particle. And we should also be very cool. But what, what to uh, say that we are provided with such a huge body temperature. So how can we maintain our cool? Right? So, so you can see that temperatures over there. It is so low. It is so low. You will be happy. Na? It's a so cool. You must be terrified right now because you will have to actually calculate this. Reason because the values are too close. They are too close, you will have to exactly calculate this particular relation and get in the value for the Kelvin temperature. So uh, this one I am going to leave it for you but not before placing in the values. Uh, I will place in the values for you. That's 76.3 nanometer. So that's 70. You can also do like this. You can first of all square this. You can also square this particular idea. Right? It, it, it's as per your convenience. Right? Convenience also. You can di do it directly also. 76.3 nanometer, so 10 power minus 9, HR 6.62 into 10 power minus 34, divided by root of 3 into M, that's the mass of electron, be careful with the masses, we actually sometimes mess up with the masses also, so uh, the electron mass we know that 9.1 into 10 power minus 31, here we have just now calculated in the previous uh, kind of question, 1.38 into 10 power minus 23, correct, and uh, into T, that's our point of interest. So you can do it like this, uh, that is 3 into 9.1 into 1.38 and into 10 power taking this up, that is minus 31 and 23. So that's minus 54 and into T is equal to this goes up, this comes down. So that's 6.62 and divided by 76.3 into 10 power minus 34 and plus 9. 
So that seems to be minus 25. And then you can square this. You can square this. So that becomes your expression. And from there, I think with a little bit of calculation and calculator, maybe <laughs> so you can get the value. You must not use the calculator must solve more often because it actually hampers with your uh, like uh, skill of solving and you will be just dependent upon the calculator every day. So you must uh, keep your mind running fast, right? A calculation should be just happening around in the mind. Okay. So don't use a calculator much as I have been used in the entire lecture. I have been a uh, uh, difficult calculation, but I eased out by using my handwork where we just uh, formulated H into C beautifully as around 2 into 10 power minus 25, right? Just in the electron microscope, we did root 150 upon V. So that's the how we should uh, write upon the calculation. We should make them simpler in not like this, that take the help of the calculator and solve it. Okay, so on solving this, you will get the value as uh, 2 Kelvin, 2 over here, and uh, that will be the answer over there. That's the B part. You can check it, okay? So let's move ahead and see the next one where it says there is a particle moving with a velocity that is three times that of velocity of electrons. So velocity of the particle is three times the velocity of the electron. Whatever we are getting, let's uh, write it down and let's say what the question demands. If the ratio of the de Broglie wavelength, so we do understand now. We are so getting so comfortable with the idea of the matter waves. The ratio of the de Broglie wavelength of the particle to that of electron is 1.8 into 10 power minus 4. So wavelength of the particle to the electron, uh, that ratio is given 1.8 into 10 power minus 4. Very good. And what is the mass of the particle? Mass of electron is given thankfully. In some question it is given, otherwise we would have forgotten it. No, it's already imbibed inside our head. What is the mass of electron? What's the mass of proton? What's the mass of neutron? What's the mass of photon? Sir, it does not exist because it cannot be brought into state of rest. No, it has a mass, but which comes from the energy mass equivalence. So you must... Uh, no certain facts with us, right? Just like what is the mass of the earth? Now some, I ask uh, someone, what is the mass of the earth? So how do I come to know? What is the mass of the sun? So how do I come to know? Of course, you are not a physicist, my dear, and you are not going to the sun uh, in Aditya mission and checking the mass of the uh, sun by keeping it in a pan balance. How do I come to know, sir, then? What is the mass of electrons? Sir, it's so tiny. How do I come to know? <laughs> so, so... So then, so you can all, always give this kind of an answer also and how many doors it is going to open for you, you know that. So you must be knowing certain facts, certain figures, certain data because a person without data is as useless as uh, someone can be without a data, right? We are the people who are very proficient in data. If you don't have data analysis, I think everything is lost. Everything is lost. We can keep on studying, 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 don't do experiments, don't do... Uh, uh, don't do data analysis, don't do statistics, don't talk about a probability distribution, then what are you are? What are you are? Living in the same age old era and not trying to be inventive, not trying to be uh, like moving ahead in your life. So you should be data specific and you must know a certain data in your head always, even if you, someone tells you, uh, don't remember this because this will be provided in the examination. This is a very stale kind of a thinking because once you're not having the data in your head, you cannot think. You cannot think intuitively because this is a data which actually generates calculations. Okay, now this can be fitted over here, just like the puzzles. If you don't have that data analysis in your mind, you cannot progress ahead. So this is my take on you that always has a certain data always uh, plays in your head, right? Okay, so let's move ahead and calculate this particular question. Uh, find the mass of the particle. So that will be easier for me because it's, a, it's talking about a uh, very base relation that what is a wavelength. That's equal to h upon p. So I'm writing the relation. Wavelength is supposed to be h upon p. That means that is equal to h upon mb. So every single relation which I have generated in the previous lectures, I have used the numerical base upon each one of them to make you comfortable. Now, h is same. That's wavelength for the proton. Not proton, my dear. S a particle. P for particle. Upon electron. So... P is for photon, P is for proton, P is for particle. This right now it's a particle. And that's equal to uh, inverse to mv. So inverse to mv. So that's mass of the particle, inverse, and speed of the particle. And inverse, mass of the electron, speed of the electron. I think it is going to solve me the question. This ratio is already given to me. That's uh, 1.8 into 10 power minus 4. Already this is given to me. It is equal to mass of the electron. That's also given to me. That's 9.1 into 10 power minus 31 divided by mass of the particle, which is my point of interest. I need to calculate that. 
and the speed of the particle is given as three times the speed speed of the electron. So I think this cancels with this. So hence the mass of the particle uh, that seems to be nine point one into ten power minus thirty one and divided by one point eight into three. And now you will be thinking, sir, will be again starting his own calculation set of calculations. Uh, and this is three, and this is approximately three. <laughs> approximately, my dear, you can also go by three point zero three over there by cancellation. This is your choice, your personal choice over there. And uh, uh, from here, that becomes three point zero three upon one point eight. I will go by three. So three upon one point eight that becomes a one upon point six. Uh, and over there, and there was a ten per minus four also that becomes ten per four over there. Correct. And so uh, this becomes ten per uh, minus of twenty seven. This many kilograms. That's it. So that becomes ten upon six, and ten upon six becomes how much? Five by three. Five by three is approximately one point six seven. So this particle mass is uh, coming out around one point six seven into ten power minus twenty seven. If you go on for exact calculation, you will get this around one point six eight. That will be the only minor you just solve the difference. Until unless options are stated in that mannerism, so uh, we can do a rough estimation in the calculations, right? So now we have solved this also. Let's move ahead. And pay tribute to the Neil Bohr theory also, the Neil Bohr theory, in which we have the single electron model around the nucleus. That's exactly the question. Is it says the De Broglie wavelength? We also know that why we are talking about this because of the quantization of the orbit concept, which we discussed in the last lecture, right? That's the that's allowed us to basically generate the questions of the De Broglie hypothesis, matter wave, and Neil Bohr theory combined, and classical electrodynamics and <laughs> classical thermodynamics also we done varieties of the questions are we ending towards a lecture that's why i'm speaking like that the de broglie wavelength associated with the electrons revolving around the nucleus in a hydrogen atom in the ground state so uh, lambda is h upon mv uh, it's in a ground state so the speed of the electron in a ground state that is uh, 2.18 into 10 power 6 meters per second i discussed this in the previous lecture also Exact calculation, how does it value arrives, is done in the Neil Bohr calculation. So don't uh, panic. We are going to do that exact calculation also in the article of the Neil Bohr. That's a promise to you, right? So uh, we place in the value over here. It's for the electron, so I know the value for the mass of electron. If you don't know it, just uh, rewind and see in the last question it was provided over there. And uh, let me place in the values over there. That's H R six point six into ten power uh, minus thirty four and divided by Uh, this is six point six two. Will it, will it work for you? Of course, right. So, what is the mass of electron? Nine point one into ten power minus thirty one, and that's two point one eight into ten power six. So now I'm uh, I'm again coming good at my way of uh, reducing it. See, see, you can see something. It is around two point two, around two point two. So that two point two into six point six. That's around six point six. So six point six upon two point two is roughly three. It's roughly three. And you can do exact calculation. Right? That is roughly three and three upon nine point one, so that's roughly nine. So that three upon nine that becomes one upon three. You might be laughing at me that so what are you doing? I am doing the rough estimations, my dear, because the options are there in front of you, right? Right. So I am doing my rough estimations. So that's approximated as around one upon three, and into the power, uh, that's minus three here, minus three and minus six, so ten power minus nine. That seems to be, and so meters, uh, so one upon three is point three three. Uh, into 10 power minus 9 meter. I think I can uh, write this happily as 3.3 into 10 power minus 10 meter. And happy with the result, 3.3 and strong. And marking the B option as a correct over there. So I solved this question in the last lecture also. You can revisit the lecture and see that I solved this particular value in the last lecture also. Why did I do it now again? Why did I do it now again? Because I wanted to modify the question as a this one. Is it a modification in the same question? That is for. A uh, moving in the next orbits, right? So in the next orbits, so this is one of the orbit. This is the next orbit. So there will be a different radius over there, right? And let's say this is the R one orbit. So this is a V one speed. If this is the R two orbit, there will be a different speed over there. That's pretty much understood. Pretty much understood that the speeds will be different in a different orbit. The question is talking about this. For this, I will be using a relation which we are going to derive in the article of the Neil Bohr, but. The question here demands that I express you that particular relation, and what's that relation? That's the speed in a higher orbit is given as equal to speed in the lower orbit. That's in the ground state. That's v naught. The value for the v naught we have read uh, that is two point one eight into ten power six meter per second. Correct. 
and v naught into uh, we have z upon m. That's expression. That's expression for the speed in the uh, nth quantized orbit. Where v naught is a ground state speed into z by n. Z is the atomic number of the hydrogen like atom. Repeating again, hydrogen like atom because the theory was basically for hydrogen atom only. And prominently for the ground state only, but then it was later on uh, given in the statements and in the mathematical expressions for the hydrogen like atoms. Like atoms means which are single electron models. So, like a singly ionized helium or a doubly ionized lithium, right? The single electron models, right? So, in this, it is a helium, so that's a singly ionized helium over there. So, the Z for the helium is how much? 2, right? So uh, that will be equal to V naught into 2 and N. N is what the third, N is the third orbit. So 2 by 3. So that's the value for the V. And that's going to solve my question. See, the wavelength is anyway given as H upon MV. So that's V in the nth orbit, correct? Nth orbit. That's the electron itself. So mass of the electron only. So that is H upon M into instead of Vm, that is V0 into 2 by 3. Correct? So that means that becomes as H upon MV0 in this question into 3 upon 2. And H upon MV0 is a value which we just now calculated in the previous question. This particular value that is H upon MV0 because that was the speed in the ground state. The question was for the ground state. Now you understand that why did I do this question once again for you? So bring back that neurons into your mind again. So that's 3.3 angstrom, this particular value. That solves my question. 3.3 angstrom and into 3 upon 2. <laughs> so that becomes 9.9 by 2. 9.9 by 2 approximate again. That's 10 by 2. So that's 5 angstrom as your result. So that's your answer. 5 angstrom. Right? So I have did so many questions for you, so many questions with you rather, uh, for you is not a proper uh, syntax over there, right? So, uh, listen to me, uh, you need to practice, you need to practice all these questions once again because they have been done by me, it has been just uh, comfortably listened by you right now, uh, sitting in your couch, sitting on your table, chair or bed, you must be sitting on a chair in the correct poster and learning the lectures, right? That should be the order, you must promise yourself and to me also that you will be doing that every time you are going to watch a lecture, right? And you must also promise that you are going to practice the questions, right? Practice the questions. I have a lot of hopes pinned on you. You will be doing uh, real good and performing well in the examination. Not a pressure, a pinned hope on you. So uh, try your best, right? Try your best and those ever who try the best, good things come to them. With this note, I am uh, taking a sign off for today. We will definitely meet you uh, very soon. Okay, bye. Thank you.